Good afternoon, everyone. I'm truly grateful for the chance to share my recent research here at HitCon. My name is Li Jiantao, and I work as a security researcher at Star Labs, a Singapore company. We won Pantuan Vancouver in the previous year, and we took second place this year. I also played CTF with Team Recapic and with Medi2 DevCon CTF Finals six years in a row. You are welcome to follow me on X, where I retweet every single post from my employer like you do. This presentation spans approximately 25 minutes, and unfortunately there won't be a Q&A session afterwards. However, if you do have any questions or thoughts, feel free to message me on X. Now let's get started. I'm pretty sure that technical people are familiar with Markdown, a plaintext text format used for writing structured documents. Its syntax is designed to be human-readable and straightforward, whether it's headers, lists, links, images, or even code snippets, except awful tables. Markdown was created back in 2004 and is everywhere to be seen today, whether you are composing documentations on GitHub or submitting bug reports via HackerOne, Markdown is always preferred thanks to its simplicity and portability. Since it's a plain text format, you can open and edit Markdown files using any basic text editor. Well, what we'd rather see is of course the rendered Markdown. There are two common rendering modes in Markdown editors. One approach involves splitting the screen into two columns, with the left side displaying the Markdown code and the right side showing the rendered output, as in VS Code and HackMD. The other method is the WYSIWYG mode, which stands for what you see is what you get, where the rendering is performed simultaneously as you're typing. This approach brings an immersive writing experience as it prevents issues such as the two columns becoming misaligned when scrolling. In this talk, I will share several interesting bugs that I found in Markdown note taking apps built on Electron Framework, namely Obsidian, Typora, and MarkText. I will also cover why security mechanisms are failing and how malicious actors can discreetly insert payloads into seemingly benign text you might copy from the web. Now the question arises, why focus specifically on electron-based markdown editors? However, this question can be further divided into two questions. To begin with, let me address the first part, why markdown editors? In the beginning, rendering markdown to HTML was quite simple. One hash sign was H1 and two hash signs were H2. As markdown became popular, different implementations began to surface. People extended Markdown syntax and renderers to support mathematical formulas, insert YouTube videos, embed PDF files, and more. Notably, one of the prevalent extensions is the support of raw HTML code. Instead of writing a link in Markdown syntax, you can actually use the A tag as well. Remarkably, these two approaches yield identical rendering outcomes. Introducing support for raw HTML undoubtedly extends the flexibility of Markdown. But if the developers fail to sanitize HTML tags or attributes adequately, it could also introduce security risks. Can I use the script tag? Can I set event handlers like onClick or onError? Can I iframe my own web page and redirect the tail frame away? There are many possibilities to discover. Moving on to the second part of the question, why focus on electron-based applications? Chances are you've seen all these keywords mentioned together before. Electron, node integration, accesses to RCE, and you've seen this payload as well. You might have already guessed what I'm going to talk about in the next 20 minutes, but for those who are not familiar with Electron, sorry I'm not going to walk you through Electron's architecture or security model, what renderer, main process, IPC is, as there are already a lot of great research articles and slides out there. Long story short, Electron combines the capabilities of Chromium and Node.js to create desktop apps. 
where Node.js provides access to various system-level APIs that are not accessible or are restricted in standard web browsers. These APIs empower developers with functionalities like accessing a file system, creating a new process, interacting with hardware devices, managing system notifications, and so on. This means if you find a cross-site scripting vulnerability in an Electron app in the right context, you will be able to access these system-level APIs. So, we now have this possible attack path where the user opens a malicious markdown file, raw HTML codes are being rendered, triggering an XSS that allows the attacker to abuse the Electron APIs and do bad things. With this understanding in mind, I decided to take a look at how these Markdown note-taking apps handle HTML code and see if I can find anything interesting. I started my research with Obsidian because I saw some of my co-workers were using it to build personal knowledge bases. By default, Obsidian presents in WYSIWYG mode. I got decent hinting and auto-completions while typing in Markdown syntax. And guess what? I can use input and even button in my Markdown document. But when I try some common XSS payloads, everything dangerous is either removed or just not getting rendered. So I look into the developer console, aka F12. It turned out that Obsidian is using Doom Purify to sanitize HTML codes. Although it's not the latest version, there are no known bypasses either. While inspecting the source code, I noticed that Doom Purify was configured to allow the iframe tag. That means I can embed my own web page and run any JavaScript code within the context of my domain. But what harm can it do? Should I exploit the outdated Chromium to pop a calculator? That might be doable but sounds boring and beyond my knowledge. Another thing that caught my eye is that when I load a local image using Markdown syntax, Obsidian renders it like this, with the absolute path of the file in the URL. I immediately went back to the console tab and switched contacts into the iframe to see if I can load an arbitrary file from this app local URL. The modern fetch API didn't like this URL scheme, but the old school one, XML HTTP request, showed me a surprising result. Yes, I can read local files from my own web page that is loaded in an iframe in Obsidian. I reported this vulnerability to Obsidian at the end of April and it's fixed within a week. Now let's take a closer look at this app protocol. Apparently, it's none of the protocols that like Chromium handles. It's a custom protocol registered via Electron Protocol API. In the source code of Obsidian, I found a handle function for this app protocol. And I also noticed that it's registered as privileged, which bypasses content security policy for resources, according to Electron documentation, which means it's allowed to send requests to app protocol from HTTP or HTTPS. There are two routing rules in the handle function. The first one is used to load static files in obsidian.sr. It does check for path traversal, so it's considered safe. But the second one is a disaster. Anything after app local is treated as an absolute path. I think the developers did realize this could be a rabbit hole. So they tried to stop iframes with different origin from reading local files by checking the referrer. Unfortunately, this security check didn't work as expected. As you can see, the referrer is empty here. That's because Chrome has changed its default behavior to not to send a referrer when a request is made cross-origin. Another factor that makes it worse is that the app protocol is registered as a file protocol. And for any request to such file protocol, Electron will conveniently add a header for you to bypass the cross-origin resource sharing policies implemented by Chromium. Here is a demo of this local file disclosure bug. When a POC file is opened in Obsidian, you can see the pop-up showing the content of Window.ini. 
It's important to note that in real-world attack scenario, malicious actors can conceal the RVM using CSS and exfiltrate the content to a remote web server. The same problem was found in another well-known Markdown editor, Typora. Typora operates in WYSIWYG mode by default and allows the use of iframe as well. Similar to Obsidian, it also registered a custom protocol. We've already learned that the app protocol in Obsidian is used to load local resources, and the same goes here for this custom protocol in Typora. The handle the function is relatively simple as you can see in this image. The only thing it does is to pass the URL to c.getRealPath function. In this function, the URL string is decoded, then the first 13 characters are removed by substring. After that, some match and replace operations are performed with regular expressions. The local file disclosure bug here is identical to the one in Obsidian. Anything after Typora app, or in another words, anything after the first 13 characters, is not modified as long as it doesn't match any of the regular expressions. So this bug can be exploited in the same way as the previous one. The attacker inserts an iframe into a markdown file, then the user opens it in Typora. The iframe loads attacker's web page, and then the web page has access to arbitrary local files. I reported this bug to Typora, and a few weeks later, they released a new stable version in which the bug was patched. But the story didn't end here. Since they didn't ask for a retest, and the release note didn't say anything about how the bug was fixed either, I took a second look at the relevant code, hoping they have fixed it right. In the new get real pass function, the string after the first 13 characters of the URL has to start with either user data or type mark. This patch did block the POC in my bug report. However, you must have already figured out the bypass, pass traversal. Whether it's user data or type mark, they are replaced with absolute paths once matched, and the rest of the URL is just appended as is. If we put this URL here, typora app type mark hash slash dot slash dot slash, we can go all the way up to the root of C drive. As shown in this picture, it's still possible to read arbitrary file from iframe. Thus, it's an incomplete fix. Well, the thing is, the vendor has already released this new stable version of Typora, so accordingly, a new CVE ID has to be assigned to this bypass. Well, I can't say who is to blame here. Maybe I should have included more proof of concept in the bug report, or maybe the vendor should have reached out to me to confirm that the fix is good enough before releasing a new version. Let's move on to the next case from cross-site scripting to remote code execution. When I was browsing the source code of Typora, I noticed that it used an even older version of Doom Purify that was released almost three and a half years ago. At first, I thought there should be a lot of bypasses in this version, but after checking through every single release note, I realized that none of the bypasses would work in Typora. But I also noticed that Doom Purify in Typora is configured to allow not only iframe, but also embed. Further tests showed that all the iframe tags are converted to web view. The web view tag is introduced by Electron to display external web content in an isolated frame and process. That means the web page loaded in a web view has no access to the top frame. To my surprise, the embed tag was not modified to web view. It's rendered as is. But don't forget, Doom Purify is doing its job here. There's no chance for JavaScript or data scheme to appear in the SRC attribute. 
I also tried to redirect the top frame away, but sadly it was blocked by the uh, prompt reminding you to save changes. Then an idea just came to me. Is it possible to find XSS in a URL that has the same origin as the top frame? By inspecting the location object, I learned that the top frame is loading a window.html from the Typora custom protocol. So I did a quick search using the DIR command and several HTML files appeared. Very luckily, one of these files has an XSS bug. The vulnerable code I found lies in updater.html. The variable named labels is extracted from location.search and assigned to inner HTML of a few DOOM elements. I think it's quite obvious that these variables are supposed to be localization strings of skip the update, remind me later, or download now for multi-language support, while the developers could have implemented this in a safer way, using inner text or text content instead of inner HTML. Now I have an XSS in a URL that has the same origin as the top frame. By loading it in the embed tag, I can execute any JavaScript code in the top frame. Here is a screenshot of alert top dot location in Typora. And of course we can use this classic payload to achieve remote code execution, since the node integration is set to true and the required function of Node.js is exposed in the top frame. Here is a demo of this XSS to RCE bug. You can see the calculator popped up when a malicious markdown file is opened in Typora. Cool, right? But what if I told you there's another way to achieve this XSS to RCE attack? Introducing copy and paste XSS. Copy and paste XSS was brought to the public three years ago by the Polish security researcher Michal Bentkowski. If you haven't read this great research before, it's not too late to do so. In brief, when you copy something from a website, the content written to your clipboard might not be what you have selected. When a copy event is triggered, a malicious actor can write anything they want into your clipboard via the clipboarddata.setData API. For example, you thought you have copied the text you selected, Lauren Ibsen, but you copied it from a hacker's website. And actually, the hacker has appended an RCE exploit in your clipboard. Now, if you paste it into a vulnerable editor, you are in big trouble. Let's check out the demo. Copy, paste, RCE. By the way, all the bugs I shared just now can also be exploited in this way. And our next bug, RCE in mark text, is triggered by copy and paste access as well. Mark text has two things in common and two differences compared to Obsidian and Typora. The common things are they all serve in WYSIWYG mode by default, and they all use Doom Purify to sanitize HTML code. But there's no custom protocols in mark text, and the use of iframe or embed is prohibited. Browsing through the GitHub issues, I was surprised by the amount of access bugs in the past. After a careful reading of each issue, I realized that there were many access bugs in the paste event handler. So I decided to take a look into this code as well. And I was very lucky to find another zero day. The following code snippet handles hyperlinks in pasted data. It iterates through all the A tags, taking out the href attributes, and fetches the title via the getPageTitle function, and writes it back to the inner HTML after sanitization. However, it seems that the developer forgot to sanitize the tags when the title fetch fails, 
or maybe let's assume that the text content was safe. Anyway, it didn't take too long for me to come up with this payload, where I put 0.0, .0 in the URL and the accesses payload after the hash sign. So when MarkTest couldn't fetch title from this URL, the access payload in the text content will be written into the DOOM. Besides using CSS, I found another way to hide the payload in WYSIWYG editors. That is, special Unicode characters combined with Markdown links. In most cases, a link in rendered Markdown only displays its title. If we put a white space or a zero width character in the square brackets, the link becomes invisible. Let's watch this demo. Copy, paste, RCE. If we switch to source code mode, we can see there's an invisible link at the very beginning of the copied text. Let me make a brief summary for this talk. Firstly, even if the app is using the most well-known library for HTML synthesization, access vulnerabilities can still exist in other parts of the process if the developers are not careful enough. Secondly, websites can tamper with your clipboard. You may have copied something that you didn't intend to copy from the web. What's more, when HTML and CSS come into play, what you see might not be what you get in these Markdown editors. And lastly, many Electron apps today are still vulnerable to RCE as long as you can find a cross-site scripting bug in the right context. Well, that's all the interesting stories I wanted to share today. Thanks for listening and thanks again to HitCon for such a great event.